Good morning and welcome to the Energy Perspectives Group webinar hosted by Extra Technologies, Inc. This event will be recorded. During the presentation, all participants will be muted. If you have any questions you would like to ask the speaker, please type them into the chat feature. We will read and answer questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now here is Dan Steffens who will introduce today's speaker. Well, welcome everybody. We had a little bit of trouble getting uh, PowerPoint up this morning, but we're ready to go now. And I'm excited uh, to have Sue uh, Osterman here uh, to speak to us today. Uh, they hosted one of our last luncheons in February at the Hess Club and the company's made a lot of progress since then. But uh, Sue is one of the world's proven leaders in innovation and manufacturing of electric motors. She has nine years of accomplishments at General Electric, acting as a CCO and CEO of GE's Small Industrial Motors Division, overseeing the division's North American and international markets, which was built into a division of $160 million enterprise. So Sue, it's take it away. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me once again. Uh, some of the information will be a, a recap of what we talked about when we were out to visit you in February, and then we'll try to offer some new information. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump in. Um, as Dan and Sabrina mentioned, you'll be on mute, but we'll be, leave lots of time for questions at the end. So what we really do is make electric motors smarter. How we do that is through the power electronics. So we are a technology company with patented technology that we like to call a new class of power electronics. And what it really does is allow the ability for a powertrain, an electric motor within that powertrain to be a gear. So we're creating, in essence, an electric gear inside of the powertrain. We do that through the power electronics. Our mission is to use minimum energy for maximum results. And I'll just take a quick minute to you know, tell you a little bit about myself once again. So I spent my entire career in the electric motor industry. I grew up in a motor repair shop, went on to work for WEG, which is one of the top industrial motors in the industry, and then on to GE. And I was with GE for just about nine and a half years, working my way up from a regional sales manager to CEO of the business unit. And I joined XRO in September of last year. So I've been there for about almost one year now. We came up with our mission statement because we're a team that's focused on how we change the way the world looks at energy consumption and constantly innovating and trying to find new ways to use energy in a better way. We have made a focus on powertrain and mobility. And the focus on the mobility industry came at the beginning of this year and so I always like to take a minute at the beginning of the presentation to just make sure everybody understands that within a powertrain the way that the energy conversion happens is through three main components a battery a motor and a power electronics so the power electronics feeds to the motor the battery stores the energy and feeds back but there's controls on the motor and on the battery in the power electronics section that essentially tells that motor and battery what to do so we are the brain, the new brain for the motors and batteries as we find new and innovative ways to integrate power electronics and upgrade the systems. Of course, there's many heavy duty applications that now include two speed gearboxes as well. The difference for what we're doing is really the ability to be able to switch in real time dynamically and on the fly. So our concepts and our features on the electric motor side are based on a concept of motors called coil switching. Coil switching is not something that we invented. It's a physics of electric motors. What we did was apply the physics of coil switching and how it was being utilized in electric motors to the inverters, allowing that power electronics to now tell the motor how to perform as it's in action, as it's in moving. As what we're doing is allowing the ability for this existing powertrain to be supercharged. So we're boosting the performance, whether that's more torque, more speed, we're allowing it to go farther and do more by using our inverter. This is a problem in the industry today because as we make this transition to electric vehicles and everybody sees it happening between startup scales up and most of the existing big five automotive companies, everybody's coming out. There's hundreds of millions of dollars being spent in R&D to develop new electric vehicles and models. But the components that are available on the market today are limiting and that's because because electric motors themselves are limiting. 
they cannot achieve the torque and speed required to get the performance that the vehicles require. So what happens is the automotive OEMs or OEMs in general now oversize the existing equipment. So they put in a, a larger motor than necessary, or we see most of the motors, most of the cars on the market today will have two or more motors. We've seen a trend even to skateboard platforms, which means there's a motor in each individual wheel. And they're also implementing in some cases, heavy mechanical geared solutions. What they're really doing is compensating. They're compensating for the type of equipment that is currently available to supply their powertrains. And they're oversizing and multiplying so that they can get torque and speed within that existing powertrain. We believe we have created what we call our first intelligent coil switching driver. So it's a new category of power electronics. Going back to that first slide, it's the ability to be the brain for the motor or the battery and allowing that motor to now perform in a different way, but still utilizing the existing motors and batteries that are on the market today. So what it does is it allows that single motor now to have greater speed, power, distance, we, because we're reducing or eliminating additional or oversized motors and reducing our eliminated gearboxes, it allows for greater weight and space, which means the vehicle will now reduce in weight and be able to perform better. Our solution allows an existing inverter to be replaced with an extra coil driver, still allowing the same benefits that they've always had with that inverter, but offering the additional benefits of the electric gearing. To be clear, we are a technology company. We don't have all of the CapEx burdens that you'd see in full-scale manufacturing. Our facility here in Canada is able to do low volume manufacturing. We do all of our design, low volume manufacturing, final assembly and testing in-house. We do that so that we can service the customers to be able to reach either smaller customers demand or larger customers with a licensing agreement and being able to get through those first 24 months when you're proof of concept and piloting and developing. Our patented technology sits not only in the technology itself, but in the topology of how the driver works. We've developed so many cases studies over the past 12 months. It's really exciting as I think about the different ones. So I'll go through three or four of them over the next two slides. Everybody relates to riding a bike. So I always like to use that as a point because I've presented to the EPG group before. I'll just remind everybody when you climb up a hill, you want to be able to climb up that hill, get torque and do it at speed. And most of the electric bikes available on the market today, you can't do that. So our first proof of concept was an electric through the bike and it sits here in Canada. If any of you are ever in Canada, you're welcome to come and take a ride and see how dynamic, how much you can't tell. We've actually installed a little LED light so our customers and investors can see that the gear is changing um, because it is so fluid. On top of that, we've also now looked at some additional vehicles, four wheel vehicles, passenger cars, high performance cars, where we've been able to increase the performance, the actual, horsepower rating of the vehicles by over 30% by utilizing our powertrain inverter in the existing powertrain. So that means that race car or that high performance vehicle will now be able to go farther. It will be able to do more laps on a single charge or it will be able to travel further distance on that single charge. Another great market that we've been talking a lot with and represented through our recent commercial agreement with C Electric is the commercial delivery van. And in that market, the transition to fleets and municipal vehicles, anything that you can get to achieve greater efficiency in the system is critical because in order for the owners to be able to have a strong cost of ownership, it has to make sense for them. They have to be able to have a good payback. On top of that, the performance of the vehicles, if you Google on the internet and, and look at buses, to delivery vans, they've had issues with climbing hills when they have full load, being able to pick up the number of garbage routes that they have in a day. So we've looked at a project for an electric garbage truck. And in that, we were able to achieve all the criteria that the customer required, greater torque, greater speed, great ability in general. That means the ability to climb up the hill or start with torque. And we were able to reduce the overall weight of the powertrain by over 30%. This allowed them to now make the decision on whether they increase their battery capacity 
or they utilize that smaller powertrain to achieve the same distance by using less energy. So maybe now that garbage truck can pick up one more extra route on the day, one more extra pickup, one more extra facility, changing the whole entire cost of ownership for the segment. In addition to that, we are now working with Sea Electric on a delivery van similar to what you'd see for like UPS or Amazon. And we anticipate seeing very substantial results with that as well. That proof of concept will deliver in the third quarter of next year. The way we do this, the way we accomplish our technology is the ability of our drive to connect into the leads of the motor. Growing up and being in the motor industry for my entire career, I can tell you this is not a big change in the manufacturing procedure for the motor manufacturer. Every motor that goes out in the market has a specified connection diagram. We need a specified connection diagram for our motor because we need the ability to access all of the motor coils themselves. So on the screen in front of you, for those who can see the screen, what you're seeing is the access to the different coils and our ability to split those coils as we go. This results in increased system power and power density. So we get top speed and torque out of that existing motor. We of course then are able to recommend to the OEM that they can now change and use a smaller motor or eliminate out as we discussed earlier in the side. This new level of optimization in the powertrain is changing the way electric mobility applications come to the market. So if you think about a traditional torque speed curve in any variable torque application, what we're really doing is optimizing the high torque and low speed and the low torque and high speed to where the motor hasn't previously been accessed because of the way that it's connected and wound. This ultimately trans into, translates into better use of that store energy. Again, we can do more laps if you're a race car. We can do more pickups if you're a garbage truck. We can do more bus, a longer bus route. Um, so it will change the way the market looks at the transition to electric vehicles, especially in high performance and fleet and municipal vehicles. Our proof of concept was delivered, our first proof of concept was delivered in December of last year. It sits in an electric bike that sits in our innovation center here in Calgary, Alberta. And what we were able to do was use our coil configurator on a very simple level to demonstrate our ability to create an electric gear. From there, we had our launching pad to be able to go up and now have larger discussions with bigger customers. We like to refer to it as our stepping stone strategy, where we have decided that we will, you know, take our time to work with customers of growing size to be able to have a large number of proof of concepts on the market over the next 18 months. This allows us to demonstrate not only what our technology can do, but just how scalable it is. We have no restraints from the technology itself. All of our restraints sit in our ability to be able to final test the size of our transformer and test facilities and the actual safety requirements required as you go up in voltage level. Currently in the mobility market, the majority of the mobility market uses a traction motor, which is a very good fit for our technology. We are able to scale everything from a microcontroller, which is like a two wheel scooter or skateboard or small bike up to a bus and test that all in hand. We could go farther, we could go into um, high speed rail or other application, but we need a partner that could load test that for us. Understanding that our market is focused on mobility, but essentially any application that has a large need for torque, a wide torque speed and needs speed, speed meaning production. So you have an oil application that has a wide torque range, but also wants to produce more, be more efficient, make more money. You have a mining application where they're crushing rock or doing something that requires a lot of torque and production or a wind generation farm. The, the fit and style of the motor is of no difference to us because we are the electronic. We're connecting into that motor. How the motor leads come out and the topology of the motor itself, we need to work with the powertrain manufacturer. When I joined last year and when I visited all of you in February in Houston, I shared that my commitment was to close eight commercial deals by the end of 2020. In February, we were at about three deals. And since then, we've signed four additional deals. So we've now signed seven of the eight deals. 
Our pipeline is very robust. We feel very confident, although there's no guarantees or promises, in our ability to close another deal before the end of the year. Given our time today, I'll just quickly focus on three of the deals. The most recent being C Electric, who's not on our slide for this presentation, but C Electric is a fleet delivery retrofit company. They are headquartered out of Australia with a North American headquarters in Los Angeles. They're quickly becoming a market leader in the transition to electric vehicles for fleet and commercial applications with deals signed with companies such as IKEA. What they do is they have partnerships with major tier one OEMs like Ford, Hino, and Iveco to purchase a chassis from that OEM. So they'll purchase an empty chassis from Ford and retrofit it at a location close to the customer. They have locations set up in Detroit and um, California, Australia, and parts of Europe right now. They'll retrofit that vehicle with their patented powertrain technology and allow the end user, being IKEA, UPS, FedEx, any of those delivery style fleet, a cost of ownership and an advantage to be able to change to an electric vehicle immediately. We have entered into a co-development with them and we'll deliver our first project with them in the third quarter of 2021. We have started that development already. It will be for a delivery van, putting our inverter inside the C drive powertrain in the third quarter of next year. After that, we're also in parallel working on an electric garbage truck. We'll allow C Electric to enter into the refuge market for the USA where you need to have a 29 ton vehicle. Just before C Electric, about May, we signed a deal with Zero Motorcycle. Zero is a world leader for electric motorcycles. They were one of the first to market with that type of product and they've been called the Tesla of electric motorcycles. They have a large volume of motorcycles that they produce every single year in the thousands. And we're working with them and we'll actually deliver that product in March of 2021, giving us our first proof of concept in a high performance two wheel vehicle. And then the last one I'll focus on is with um, Potencia. Potencia is a company out of Mexico, which we've just done a recent press release for. You can find that press release on our website at www. Dot exro .com. Potencia was a two-stage project. The first stage was that we were going to deliver a customized driver, so an inverter that was customized for their application without the electric gearing in it. High power electronics, advanced power electronics design. We completed that design. It was a few weeks late due to COVID and delays both at their factory and at our supply chain, but we delivered that at the end of June. They have been testing and have released the shared press release with us that the testing is going very well and exceeding expectations. And we will finish that testing towards mid to end of October, at which point we will supply to them the customized driver with the electric gearing inside that is currently being produced in our factory in our facility here in Calgary in parallel to the testing they're doing in Mexico. So we'll deliver that in early November, late October, which will provide our first proof of concept in an electric vehicle, which will be on the streets in a taxi or light passenger vehicle in the city of Mexico before the end of the year, utilizing the Potencia Pronto Power flexible powertrain. Basically their powertrain allows you to take an existing gas combustion engine and convert it to electric. So they actually take the vehicles in, remove the combustion engine, and install their new flexible powertrain. This is critical for changes in underdeveloped countries like you'd find in Latin America or Southeast Asia or different parts of the world where they can't afford to just dump these vehicles and fleets that they have thousands and hundreds of cars and trucks. And this allows them to convert it and be able to get a better cost of ownership. From a technology roadmap perspective, by the end of this year, we'll have three key proof of concepts. The first one being the microcontroller, which is good for two wheel, like electric bikes and small scooters. We'll have what we call a hundred volt controller, which is good for light vehicle and passenger cars um, outside of North America. And then the 400 volt is the final one. And that one we'll have ready right at the end of the year to the first weeks of January. The 400 volt is common in most North American or European built vehicles. This would give us proof of concepts for 90% of the battery electric vehicles that are coming to market today. 
In parallel, we're working on a larger voltage, uh, larger model of the 400 volt, which would take you into SUVs and um, delivery trucks, like you'd find with C Electric on the small delivery van and high performance vehicles. And that would take us into the 800 volt, which will be finished by the end of next year. We continue to innovate new and different ways to use our technology with our battery management software as well, enabling the positioning to take our switching and apply it to a battery management system and allow first life batteries to be able to be used in a second life application like stationary storage. That R&D continues and we should have our proof of concept finished by the very early parts of January, hopefully by the end of December, but by the very early parts of January. Our business model, how we go to market, is really important for everybody to understand. It's dictated by the nature of the automotive industry more than the nature of our technology itself. From the EXO side, when we enter into a due diligence with a customer, we basically start talking to a customer, any level of customer from a Harley to a Ford to a startup company, like what Potencia is doing with their powertrain. We use our simulation tools. It's a program called ANSYS. It's one of the top simulation programs in the world right now used by all motor manufacturers um, or almost all motor manufacturers. We use our simulation software to apply the algorithms from our gearing and determine if it's a good fit for XRO. This due diligence stage is something that we've entered into in the last six or seven months to ensure that all the partners that we enter into an agreement with are partners that we feel pretty safe that they're gonna get good value from our electric gearing, that we're gonna be able to optimize the system, offer them a cost competitive solution and bring value to their application. That represents our pipeline. That first due diligence stage is our pipeline. And as I've mentioned, we have a very robust pipeline, many customers on NDA that we're talking to all the time that are feeding us the different stages and milestones that they like to see us reach to be able to enter into an agreement. Once we have an agreement with a customer, we enter into our proposal where we've agreed to a timeline to develop and co-develop a proof of concept. In most cases, XRO is taking on the expense of the development, not in all cases, but in most cases. But the customer is also taking on expense as they're investing in resources and the final testing. In order to get any component in a powertrain to market in the automotive industry, you need it to be tested on the road in a vehicle. So we need these partnerships to be able to take our product to the final stage so that we can enter into those agreements with top tier one customers and get our product to market. The proof of concepts with the eight commercial deals that we'll be engaged in gives us a proof of concept for a variety of different applications from a two wheel bi bicycle to a high performance motorcycle to an electric snowmobile, an electric water application with a boat, um, electric car, electric delivery van, an electric cedar for the agricultural industry, which would open up the markets of construction and heavy duty mining. From there, once the customer enters into that agreement with us and agrees that they'll put this into their equipment and continue the development for us, we go into full development and design. Our full development and design, as we're entered into on the seven projects right now, takes us anywhere from three months to six months or more, depending on the level of information that we get from the customer and how quickly we can implement and test that proof of concept. We do have a platform design that we utilize for every application, but every application is customized. Every application needs a little bit of tweaking to fit their drivetrain and their data logging, and then there's a lot of testing involved after that. Once the customer gets the product, the proof of concept, and it's accepted, then we move into a negotiation on our volume, which could be low volume manufacturing through the extra facility and contracted manufacturers, or a licensing agreement, depending on where we are. All of our projects right now are undergoing, and as you've heard, we have proof of concepts and customer acceptance anywhere from November of this year to March to the third quarter of next year. So we have a variety of different proof of concepts that will put us into our revenue stage in the coming months. From a revenue projection model, what we see happening is we'll start to see small revenue over the end of 2021 and 2022 with forecast and anticipated, not guaranteed, numbers of an EBD positive revenue stream by the end of 2023. 
This is through the current projects that we're working on, through the current pipeline that we're working on. This is not even considering all the market that we haven't got out to yet, that we know is gonna open up for us in the coming months as we get the next proof of concepts. There's over $300 billion being invested in the EV technology, over 26 billion in the global inverter market. That's not just in powertrains, that's in all of the inverter market. In the global powertrain market, the inverters take up over $7 billion. From a team perspective, I'm the CEO. I'm pleased to talk with you again. I have John Mikkelsen, who's my CFO. John has over 12 years of experience working with other startups in different spaces, but also working with companies like Haywood, where he worked for over 15 years, and different private companies that he took public. So very familiar with all of the requirements that we need to uplist to the different boards and to be publicly traded. In November, I brought in Josh Sobel from Siemens Canada. Josh was the Siemens Mining Canada segment leader. I met Josh while I was at GE. He's a mechanical engineer and worked at the GE Peterborough plant designing motors. And then he moved on to Siemens about six or seven years ago and worked his way up to the segment leader for Canadian mining. And Josh joined us in November and has been leading our transition to a focus on commercialization. I brought in Eric Hoots in May as I did a transformation of my engineering team as we moved from a focus on the R&D side to a focus on commercialization while still innovating, but a real tight focus on the mobility industry. I really wanted an engineering manager that would be able to support me with experience in manufacturing the automotives themselves, even though we weren't going to be a manufacturer as we talked to the different customers on how to license and how to get those larger agreements. I knew I needed somebody that understood the customer side of it. So Eric brings over 20 years of engineering experience in power electronics with companies such as KSR, where he developed power electronics for most of the tier one automotive sector. And then most recently, about two weeks ago, I brought in Richard Moe. Richard was my director of marketing while I was at GE. After I left and joined Xro, Wolong promoted him to GE's marketing and digital leader globally for all of the Wolong and GE products. And Richard and his wife join us from Houston, Texas. And he just relocated two, no, three weeks ago. He's out of quarantine. So we're happy to have them here and show them their first real snowfall. And then from our board of directors, I, I should say on my team too, the important thing about my team is outside of myself, everybody on my team is engineers or power electronics or electrical or mechanical engineers. That's a thought premeditated team building so that as we communicate out to market, whether it's to a customer or to our marketing campaigns, we're making sure that we're identifying ourselves as advanced power electronics specialists, taking a new category in that marketplace. And our marketing campaigns have been working great as we started to do that about 60 days ago. We've already been covered by engineering.com, by rideapp.com, um, by quite a few bloggers who cover companies such as Tesla and Nikola. Uh, we've had over 200,000 hits on our most recent YouTube blogger. These are all unsolicited, unpaid coverage as we've been coming out more openly with our technology and exactly where we are. On our board of directors, we are chaired by Mark Godsey, our outgoing CEO. Mark is a serial entrepreneur, very highly recognized across North America. He was co-founder of ID Biomedical, which became one of Canada, actually one of North America's top five vaccines in the world. It was acquired by GlaxoSmith by over a billion dollars. He then went on to, to co-found Angiotech Pharmaceuticals, which created the coding for the titanium heart scent and also went on to exit for well over a billion dollars. Um, he's co-founded many other companies such as Mojio in the technology space. And um, it, we are just very lucky to have him. He helps us a lot from our perspective and is a great source to our executive team. We have Jill Bodkin and Frank Botswitz, Amen Percy, who was a VP, a retired VP of operations for Ballard Power. Ballard Power is one of the top and first fuel cell manufacturers in the world. We're also supported by a very strong advisory board. Uh, Daryl Wilson is the chair of our advisory board and he comes as an officer, a retired officer of GE Power. We have Varel Nika, who, was part, who is the current Canadian services leader for Schneider Canada. We have Werner Kurtz, who is the retired 
Engineering Manager for Siemens Global for drives and motors. And we recently announced Gary Marr, who is a top um, political figure who heads the Canada West Foundation and is helping us to work with our governments globally to participate in whatever regulations and incentives and how we help facilitate the change for most of the municipalities that are putting out net zero targets. From a finance perspective, we just finished a raise here in Canada about one month ago. We were out raising $5 million through a brokered round with Gravitas Investment Bank. Gravitas was able to secure $8 million for us. At the time of the raise, we actually had a very strong bank account. We had enough to get us through the end of the year, so about nine months left, having done a private placement round in late February, where we oversubscribed at $3 million. We were out raising $3 million. We oversubscribed at four point three. With COVID and the unanticipated way that the markets were behaving, we decided that we had hit a majority of our milestones that we had put out for the end of the year. We had hit them a little bit earlier. We had felt we were in a really good position and it was a good time for us to go back out to market and hopefully avoid a potential second wave of shutdown coming in October and November. And we were very well received and are thankful for the support we received. It has allowed us to have runway through the end of next year and to be able to execute on finishing up our, our innovation center, which will be a state of the art testing lab and to continue to file additional IP. Our current IP sits at 17 granted globally and we've granted in all countries that we know are at high risk for IP infringement like China, India, Brazil, um, and we also have 17 patents pending. Um, I would say right now, the biggest milestones that we see coming up are definitely the next two proof of concepts that we're coming out with in November. I think those will be a really huge change for us at XRO as it will give us tense, test bench data for our electric gearing in large vehicle and performance vehicle applications. Um, which we've all simulated and done in small form right now, the ability to do them in large form will show the market that we have the ability to manage the topology through our patents, handle harmonics and noise, and really become a market leader in the power electronics for the EV industry. Um, and then, of course, our eighth deal um, is another key change for us. And the, the, the completion of our innovation center towards the end of this year will really um, give us a center where we'll be able to work with other companies and be passionate about how we use energy better. Um, I think that's my time. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to Dan and any questions that everybody has. And I thank you for your time. Thanks, Sue. Uh, that was great. Uh, before I get into the questions, I have some that were emailed to me. Uh, I just wanna remind everybody that uh, you can put your questions in the chat box and I'll see them and then I'll read them to Sue. But uh, I also want to say uh, one of my favorite say, uh, sayings is uh, speed of the team is speed of the leader. And I can tell that uh, Sue's got a high speed. <laughs> she has high torque and high speed. So I think this team's got a lot of a good chance of success. But let me get into a few of these questions here, Sue, that were e emailed to me. And I think you covered most of these, but um, what are your what's your key uh, focus applications for XRO in the coming months? Like, what are you do, going to do before you're in? Right. So the, the key ones are definitely that next proof of concept in the hundred volt that we'll deliver to Potencia in November. That one is really it's 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 really hard to even say how important that is, but I I can tell you that it's what we live and breathe at XRO. That gives us a a bunch of data points and test bench data that will allow us to talk to the bigger tier one customers on a much different level um, than we're able to today. And that's where they can replace the internal combustion engine with an electric in, a, in an existing vehicle. Correct, it takes our technology to the next generation. Previous to that, we were actually utilizing our technology as an add-on module. This actually allows you to replace the existing inverter with our inverter, with the gearing built in, and at a, in a cost competitive manner. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a, the one problem that I've always had with all these projections of how many electric vehicles there's going to be is, well, what are people going to do with their old vehicle? They're not just going to throw it away. So, because right. <laughs> then you got to include that cost into buying the uh, EV then. So uh, I always thought that was a problem. So that, that definitely sounds like a major milestone. So, okay. So the, uh, are there any other 
new areas of innovation that you're looking for to uh, apply your technology, like generators or uh, just batteries? Yeah, for sure. So definitely from a, from a from a generator perspective, we have um, uncovered in the past few months that we feel it doesn't actually matter if it's going into any style of motor or any style of generator, the power electronics, the driver will be able to perform. It's really more about the application itself and the topology of the motor leads themselves. So we are continuing to look at different generator applications where we feel we'd be a good fit commercially. Um, and then from the battery side, yes, we definitely are continuing to develop our intelligent battery management system where we pull our battery management software into an inverter and allow um, companies the ability to utilize second life applications. So that means that we're going to take that first life battery and utilize our technology to now use it into a second life stationary storage application. And we've been hitting some great milestones with that technology and we'll come out before the end of the year with a proof of concept in our commercialization plans. Okay. Um, I think you covered a lot of this stuff. But it, 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 somebody that went to the February luncheon here in Houston asked that you talked about seven or eight partnerships that you thought were promising. Uh, Let's see, you, I think you gave a recap in your presentation, but it, you want to hit what are the top three partnerships you're looking at right now? For sure. Top three partnerships would be Sea Electric, which is the company out of Australia that's doing the retrofit for the last mile vehicles. We're going to do a step up delivery van for them, the equivalent of what you'd see at UPS or FedEx. The second one would be the zero motorcycle, high performance electric motorcycle, putting our proof of concept for any high performance electric vehicle, including cars. And then the third one would be the clean seed or, well, I, I tie clean seed and, and, and Potencia. Potencia is our first proof of concept in an electric vehicle, which is November. And clean seed is a agricultural equipment, which a lot of people go past because it's agricultural, but this is a huge piece of equipment. The fact that we're going to be able to electrify that and change and optimize that system will open up doors for heavy duty mining trucks and underground uh, mining. So yeah, I think yeah, those, those yeah. would be key. Yeah, you know, the, the company that hosted our last webinar up, uh, the Graphite Mining Company out of uh, Quebec, Yes, uh, they said their mine is going to be fully electrified. All the equipment is going to be electric. The oh, big trucks and front end loaders and everything are going to be electric. So market for that. Um, okay, this, here's a question uh, coming out of Dallas. Curse. One, uh, he asked, are we recording this? Yes, we are recording this and we will send out a link to the recording to all of our members our global membership. So uh, his other question is, who are your major competitors? Right. Um, so we don't, we actually don't have any competitors on the power electronic side with electric gearing. We are first to market for electric gearing. I still say that we have competition with what I call shift technology. So where we have scale up or customers, uh, manufacturers that are starting to make different styles of electric motors themselves, where they're trying to achieve that same configuration. They're trying to get more torque and more speed out of a new design of electric motor. The interesting thing about those competitors is we can still work with them. So they're a competitor, but a partner. Mm, okay. Uh, and then his uh, other question was, do you have a protective moat uh, or that makes it difficult for others to compete with you, like patents on your technology, I guess? Absolutely, we do. So we, we do spend a lot of time and investment in ensuring our patents are protected. On top of that, we do not patent our algorithms because they obviously are algorithms and you don't want them out to market. Um, and then the third thing, internally, we have a very um, stringent cybersecurity program that we use. And then the final thing is, even if somebody was to take, if somebody was to go to Calgary warehouse and steal my proof of concept bike, it would only apply to that existing application because we have customized it to that. So the redevelopment and redesign and reverse engineering would take them years from our estimations. Oh, okay, cool. Um, there's a question here. What was the pricing of your last uh, financing, last placement? Yeah, so our last placement was in February, was in uh, July, the, the middle of July, and we were at 70 cents Canadian. And just for everybody to kind of gauge that, when we did the private placement in February, we were at 35 cents, and we're over a dollar today. Mm, good. Uh, what's the strike prices on the options and your warrants? 
I am drawing a blank and normally I have that right off the top of my, I've got somebody, Vic, if you're, if you're, if you're not on mute, can you, do you know what the strike price and on the options and warrants were? There, uh, there are a bunch of different uh, prices to my knowledge. Um, so I'd have to get that and uh, send it out to you, but there, uh, to my knowledge, there, there are a number of different warrants and options under uh, different prices. Right. I think you're right. I think I, I know the average, but uh, well, can we follow up with that one just to make sure? Yeah, I, and, I, 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 hate yeah, to I can just put, I could put an answer to that in the uh, email when we send it out with the recording. Perfect. Okay. Um, oh, and this uh, one, one of the guys that attended the uh, Houston luncheon in February says, how was, how has the move from Vancouver to Calgary turned out? Um, <laughs> I want to say fantastic and wonderful, but it's been time consuming and hard, um, but we're getting there. So we definitely, you know, did all of that during the COVID time. So simple things like getting a trucking company right. to pick up our stuff and bring it here has all required a, an enormous amount of time from our team, but we have successfully closed our Victoria location. Um, we are successfully only in the one location now. We are currently under construction. Um, all of our office space and our and our innovation, as far as you know, being able to showcase our technology from a front view, is there. The back warehouse, we have a temporary lab set up that we're able to continue developing. Um, our larger lab is we've been waiting for it, and we continue to wait for the larger lab equipment to arrive in from Europe. Um, and so we are hoping that we'll have it finished sometime in November, although it could it could fall another couple of weeks is what we've heard in the recent weeks. But overall, it's been going great. We're definitely happy to be here. We've had an enormous response from the city of Calgary and from local um, engineers who want to come and work for a technology company. We've had an enormous response of power electronics engineers located all over the world that are happy to relocate here because we have a low cost of living. Um, and it's a great place to live, but from an actual physical perspective, we're, we're making our way through that. But, um, I, I, I feel like we'll, we'll get there by the end of the year. Yeah. Hey, uh, I could tell you, I feel your pain when I yeah. was with, when I was with Hess, we moved from Tulsa to Houston and 80% of the people in my finance or financial group refused to move. I had 80% oh. turnover and it was tell, let me tell you, it was hell for about six months. <laughs> Wow. And, and we've managed. So when I, when I met the group in, in February, we were at about 10, 10 to 12 people. We're at about 18 right now. We have yeah. two um, offers out to get us up to 20. And of our 18, uh, six of our 20 people, 16 of us will sit here in Calgary. Um, our finance team did stay in Vancouver. We have a small office right downtown Vancouver that they all share. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have an application engineer that sits in Western and Eastern Canada for us servicing down through the Detroit area. Do your people have to do a lot of traveling, like go down to Mexico with the companies using it? So we are one of those companies that has totally embraced our new virtual world. So normally, yes, we all traveled probably an embarrassing amount considering we're a clean tech company. Um, we have since decided that we are really good at virtual presentations. Um, and so we've actually invested. We have our own little studio being put together in the new center. Um, we have a full drop down screen. We have all kinds of electronics that allows us to be interactive. Um, so we will continue to travel, of course, when the time comes. But for now, we haven't found a slowdown from doing it remotely. Okay, good. Oh, I can tell you, Susan and I got, got cabin fever and we went down to Cancun about six weeks ago. <laughs> and I felt, I felt safer making that trip than, trip than going to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, we had we we've done a couple of um like in Canada we can travel we we've, we've got uh you know among ourselves some of our team is still relocating from outside of uh, Calgary so we had everybody except for the American counterparts come up and um, it was amazing they we all felt great we went out to dinner we 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 really had a great couple of days together we're doing it again actually tomorrow um, the only problem we've had is we, we do have some employees in the U.S. that work remotely and they can't come up because of the two weeks. But like I told you, Richard, my chief marketing officer, just came up from Houston, Texas. He and his wife are from Florida. Oh, um, they've lived in Houston under the GE banner for the last five years. Um, his wife has never seen snow in her life. <laughs> and due to COVID, they couldn't come and check it out first. <laughs> so he, he, he kind of checked out the technology, did his due diligence all remotely, but they couldn't actually come and walk here and feel the weather and see what it was like. Um, so they just got out of quarantine a few days ago and are, luckily it's sunny. So. Well, I, I could tell him that uh, 
the weather can change quickly in Calgary. <laughs> it can. can I was there one day. I flew in, and I think it was fifty degrees, and I think it was zero the next morning when we woke up. So, uh, right, but it I, is. I, it is actually a lot of people think that it's oil and gas only, but we have a lot of great technology coming yeah. into Calgary. We have very low taxes as a commercial city, um, and we have a lot of pilots. Um, we're actually one of the top cities in North America using Lime scooters. We're actually one of the top cities using uh, change over to municipal uh, to municipal fleet vehicles. We have net 2030 targets um, across Alberta. Um, and we also have international flights all day long, every day. Um, so it's actually, a, a lot of people don't realize it, but it's actually a, a really great place to be located as a technology company. Yeah, it, it is. And it's a great place to visit for anybody that wants to it go it up is. there. Uh, I've got one more question. I think sure. that'll do it. Okay, when do you think XRO anticipates recurring revenues of any kind? We anticipate some recurring revenues um, by the, I'd, I'm gonna call it the beginning of 2022. I mean, if everything goes ideally, we might see that into the end of 2021. Um, but by the beginning of 2022, um, and then, like I mentioned, we, you know, we really see that scaling pretty quickly as we get into these different deals, getting to those production lines is um, within about 12 months from now. So um, EBDA positive by the end of 2023 is our forecast. Okay. Now, do you, do you have enough capital in place to make it that far? We will need another raise before we get that far. Okay. Um, we're going to do our best. Uh, we, you know, we've, we're applying for different grants right now through the government. We're, we're doing our best to see, but I think that we will need another raise, um, you know, when, when our money gets low again. Unless Leon Musk just buys you, right? Unless that happens. <laughs> make it, make it a big number. That's all. That's I right. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. And like I said, we will uh, tweak up the recording a little bit and uh, uh, send it out later today or tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dan and Sabrina.